morning, just before we get our morning service started, let me draw your attention to a few announcements. First of all, this Friday, September 16th, is our annual evangelism seminar. Many of you have joined with us through the years, and we are looking forward to another special evangelistic seminar. This seminar is open to everyone, and it will begin, or excuse me, it will be on an evening full of practical instructions and helps for you. And so we encourage you to join us. This seminar will be from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. and be right here in the Crown Center, and all of you are invited to attend. Make plans to be with us this Friday. And then Conquer Series is a 10-week DVD course for men on sexual purity. And of course, this is designed to help equip and strengthen and prepare men to be the leaders that God has called them to be. This series is for all men. And if you are a teenager, age 16 and older, and you would like to attend, you can do so if you attend with your father. And this series is for men who are struggling with, wanting to avoid struggling with, or wanting to help others overcome their addiction to pornography. And it meets on Thursday evenings from 6.30 to 8 p.m. over in the Gathering Place, which is formerly known as the St. John Building. And it will begin this Thursday, September 15th. The cost is $10 per person that helps offset some of the study materials you will be using. Registration for the Evangelism Seminar and Conquer Series is available on Realm and on campuschurch.com slash events. And then our annual food truck festival is just a few weeks away. It is on October 1st from 11 to 3, 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it'll be located over behind the gathering place. There will be over 20 food trucks for you to choose from. Plus, we'll have some inflatables and activities and things like that for the children to enjoy. And so everyone is invited. We encourage you to pick up some flyers today from the lobbies and begin encouraging others in our community to join you, maybe even some of your neighbors. We hope to see you there. It's going to be a wonderful afternoon. If you're new to Campus Church and you're interested in membership or maybe you're just interested in uh, more about Campus Church and what we stand for, uh, this Bible study group, the Next Step Bible study group, is for you. And it's taught by our pastor, Pastor Redland. And the material in this class repeats every few months. And so you're welcome to jump in at any time. And we invite you to join this Bible study group next Sunday morning at 9 a.m. right here in the Crown Center in the Allen Reception. As we begin this very special service honoring our first responders, we also remember that this is Patriot's Day. And we, along with our nation, remember the sacrifices made by so many on a very important day. On September 11th, 2001, the course of American history was suddenly changed. We remember the chaos and the confusion, the destruction, and the heartbreak, the shock of 3,000 lives lost in a single day. But we also remember the great resolve of everyday people, the acts of heroism that brought us together, the men and women who stood in the gap somehow still fighting, giving every ounce of strength to help others. Decades have passed since that historic day. And in that time, we have learned that despite all the suffering and loss, our God remains faithful. Even when smoke and debris obscure our paths, His unfailing love will carry us through. As we remember those who were lost, let us honor their memory with our lives, giving our own strength to help the hurting, making sacrifices for those around us, and sharing the faith which brings eternal hope and peace. This is our promise and our prayer for 9-11. Today we recognize and honor Patriot Day. It's a day that we saw great valor on display. While people were running away from buildings, our first responders were running into them at the risk of their lives, and many of, many of them lost their lives. So we honor that today, and we're thankful for them and for their sacrifice. They showed us what it means to serve with valor. We honor those that serve there and then, and then we honor our first responders that serve here in our own community. We love them, we appreciate them, we pray for them and support them. 
We're thankful for our first responders that make us safe. And so today we, we honor you. Let's begin by saying the Pledge of, the Le of, of Allegiance to the flag. Let's all stand together. We'll say that together. And then we'll sing God Bless America. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice. a song we all know. It's number 130 in your hymnal, Amazing Grace. We'll sing verses 1, 2, and 4. And I might add that it is purely because of the amazing grace of a gracious God that we today in these United States of America enjoy unprecedented freedom to gather and to magnify the name of Jesus Christ as we assemble together today. Hey, thank you all for joining us for such a, I don't know, a, a day that we've been anticipating, looking forward to and now finally realizing, and that is a day on Patriots Day that we have gathered to honor and recognize our first responders. I'm going to officially recognize them in just a few moments, but I did want to say, uh, obviously, thanks to many that are here today, and then thank you, special thanks to those who brought vehicles for us to enjoy. There are vehicles that could be here on display. There are some that could not because they are called away or they are attending to other business. But thank you for bringing the vehicles. And how many of you had the opportunity to see the Escambia County Sheriff's special pursuit vehicle, so to speak? How many of you saw the Corvette today? I don't know if you know this or not, but that Corvette was bought and fully paid for and donated to the Escambia County Sheriff's Department. Some people wonder like, wow, what are they doing spending that kind of money? It was fully donated by a drug dealer. And, um, <laughs> and so he was not necessarily a willing donor, but he did, 
He did donate it. It got a new paint job, some special lights, and it is clearly serving a higher purpose. So <laughs> thanks to the uh, Sheriff's Department for bringing the special vehicle. I don't know if you noticed this on the way in, but there is a special 9-11 display of American flags along Main Drive as you, as you come in. There are a total of 2,977 flags that are placed in memorial, and they are obviously honoring each of those fallen dead who lost their lives on 9-11. And that memorial is sponsored and planned and then coordinated by the Freedom Forum, a group of students at Pensacola Christian College. And so all of those flags were placed by a group of about 25 students from that forum. And if you didn't have the opportunity to see it on the way in, I trust you'll take an opportunity on your way out to go by and obviously recognize a very special um, flag on display memorial for us as we remember Patriots Day and those lives lost. And then I'd like to take a moment before we will introduce some others today that, that we will recognize as a congregation. There are two that are here today that are present as our elected officials. And I wanted to take a moment just to recognize both of them. First of all, Senator Doug Broxson is here, and I'm not exactly certain where he's seated, but Senator Broxson, so I can see, he's right back here. Senator Broxson represents District 1, and uh, I might add he represents our district quite well. I've had opportunity on numbers of occasions to sit and enjoy fellowship there's something special about that word. It means that we share something in common. And so have had opportunity to enjoy wonderful fellowship with Doug Broxson and grateful for his service as he represents District 1 as our senator in Tallahassee. And then Chip Simmons. Um, sheriff Simmons, if you would please stand. Uh, the sheriff has been serving in law enforcement in Pensacola for maybe the majority of his life. And so, Officer Simmons, appreciate so much what you do. He has been in the position of sheriff since 2020. He has been a personal friend. He's been a friend of Campus Church and certainly a friend of the citizens of Escambia County. Let's recognize both of these men. Thank you so much. For your If you're a guest that is joining us here today, then thank you for joining us on this very special day here at Campus Church. And, and if you are a guest here, we're gonna encourage you to take one more step of connection. Uh, our, our full transparent um, desire, just so you know, we would love for you to sense that you are among friends here at Campus Church. And if you're looking for a church to call home, we would be most honored if you'd consider Campus Church. If you are a guest, then, then another way to connect would be to take a copy of the bulletin, and then right inside there's a little welcome guest tab, and if you fill that out, take it after the service out to the main lobby to our welcome center, and if you'll present it to some of the hosts that are there, we've prepared a special uh, gift for you, a way for us to recognize your attendance, and a way for us to say thank you for joining us today. We think about the amazing grace of Almighty God that has preserved us as a nation. Trust can be misplaced, certainly that is true, but trust can also be offered in that which is trustworthy. The Bible says it this way. In Isaiah chapter 26, verse number four, the Bible says, trust ye in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Listen as the Rejoice Choir sings today for us, in God we trust, in God alone. Thank you. 
this time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce a very special guest that is in attendance joining us today on the platform here at Campus Church. Mr. Timothy Gegline served for seven years in the George W. Bush White House and ran the day-to-day -day operations of the Office of Public Liaison, a White House department under Deputy Chief of Staff Carl Rove. During his seven years as public liaison, Gegline helped establish the White House Office of Faith-Based and Community Initiatives and other high-priority departments. A White House statement said that he also played an important role in the confirmation of Supreme Court Justices Samuel Alito and John G. Roberts. In January 2009, Gegline became the top Washington lobbyist and spokesman for Focus on the Family Action the lobbying arm of Focus on the Family. The Colorado-based organization said Gegline is its eyes and ears in Washington as it lobbies on issues such as fighting against same-sex marriage and their stand against abortion. He's currently the vice president for external relations at Focus on the Family based in Washington, D.C. Tim's the author of several books, including The Man in the Middle, The Inside Account of Faith and Politics in the George W. Bush Era, and the soon-to-be-released Toward a More Perfect Union, the moral and cultural case for teaching the great American story. I've had the special honor of hearing Tim speak on a number of occasions, found him to be as personally gracious as he is publicly insightful and engaging. It is a special honor to have him with us today at Campus Church. Please welcome with me Mr. Tim Gegline. Good morning, everyone. It is great to be here. I flew in from the swamp yesterday. Uh, somebody asked me uh, when I arrived, what has become of Washington? What is Washington? And I said simply, it is 68 square miles surrounded by reality. Uh, and so being here at Pensacola, I want to just say it's so nice to be back in the United States of America. Um, <laughs> it's a remarkable country, isn't it? You know, you can't plan these things. I'm raising my right hand. I received an email last week saying, uh, Mr. Gagline, when you arrive on Saturday at Pensacola Christian College, will you come out and join us for the emplacement of flags uh, at our, at our uh, college? And so upon my uh, arrival yesterday, by the way, I'm not sure where Luke is. He's the best host uh, in the history of Pensacola Christian. Uh, we had a wonderful dinner together. We came back. I walked down and saw my new best friend, Olivia, who organized the emplacement of one flag for every person uh, we lost on 9-11, nearly 3,000 flags. And I'm an early morning person, and on my walk this morning, it was the first thing I went out to see. Even on this kind of cloudy day, uh, the sun was peeking through on all of those flags. You know, hand over heart, I, I'm not exaggerating. If I live to be a thousand years old, I will never forget being in the White House on 9-11. It was the most beautiful day, I think, in the history of the United States. It was almost Edenic. It was so beautiful that morning. I had visited with a friend of mine over breakfast at the Hay Adams Hotel across the street from the White House. I walked back to my office, and uh, here's how coincidental things are. I'm in Florida, obviously, this morning. And on that morning, 9-11, President Bush was in this state. He was in a school, and his goal was to take Air Force One back to Andrews Air Force Base, uh, get on Marine One, land on the South Lawn, go back to the Oval Office, and then come over to a meeting that my office was hosting. Are you ready for this? Hosting with the American Association of Christian Schools, which I know has both a formal and informal uh, relationship with this great college. And you can't make this up. I mean, this is, this is the life of those of us who are honored to follow Jesus Christ, that we can't determine or really plan or schedule 
how any day of our life is going to unfold. I met a woman several years ago who was on Pearl Harbor the day of the bombing. And 9-11 was the Pearl Harbor of our generation. And I came back to the White House and we were preparing to welcome our guests from the American Association of Christian Schools who would spend at least an hour with President Bush. And as I prepared to go down to the 17th Street entrance to the White House to begin welcoming our guests, we began getting these reports from New York. And, uh, and as the clock ticked by, we realized that people were not coming in the turnstiles to the White House, but in fact going out. And within 10 minutes on the side of the White House, it was total and complete chaos. Cars going each way on 17th Street, people running out of buildings as if every single one had been hit on 9-11 all the reports coming in that the Pentagon had been hit, that the Capitol may have been hit, reports that an airplane, one of the four, as we would all know, was heading toward the White House. It was sheer mayhem. I remember and I wrote in my book that I have never seen in my life a grown man running down a hallway at the White House yelling, get out, get out, this is real. And all of those images are implanted very deeply in my soul. But I came to Pensacola today to share with you an image that I hope is embedded forever in your soul, especially as a brother and sister in Christ. We all saw that remarkable video this morning of the Twin Towers. Who can forget it? Who can forget the image of one ring of the Pentagon which I drove by every morning on my way to the White House. And on and on it goes. Shanksville, Pennsylvania, a dear friend of mine was killed that day. Here's an image that I hope that some of you, all of you, will carry with you for the rest of your life. That in that scene of total and complete mayhem on 9-11, in that moment where we all can rightfully ask, is God really in control? I mean, it all seemed unhinged and unglued. And our cities were savagely attacked. Every single person with the American Association of Christian Schools who thought they had gotten up that morning to come to the White House to have a personal meeting with the President of the United States, while every other person in Washington, D.C., in and around the White House, were running and seeking shelter and peace, the American Association of Christian Schools attendees and guests, they began impromptu right next to the White House to form these circles where the center of all of those groupings were prayers for peace to Jesus Christ. All these years later, I am moist-eyed when I remember what these, what these remarkable people were doing. While the rest of the so-called most powerful city in the world residents, office workers, government workers, lawyers, lobbyists, members of the media, while they were pouring out of their offices in fear, our fellow Christians, the American Association of Christian Schools, I don't doubt, uh, you know, uh, alums of this college were forming these prayer circles introducing the gospel of Jesus Christ and reassuring people that even in the mayhem there was peace, there was serenity, and there was consolation to be found. 
I personally heard several members that morning sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, perhaps for the first time, with men and women who, like everybody else that day, got up thinking, I wonder what today will bring. I have no doubt in my mind that in the middle of chaos and terror, in the middle of fear, in the middle of stress and anxiety, quite literally at the beginning of a war, that even in that moment, with tenderness and grace and mercy and kindness and goodwill, with limitless love that can never be equaled in the history of mankind, Jesus Christ is present. Even in our own lives, when we come to one of those moments where we think, I think I'm at the bottom. I think I'm at the end of my rope. This example on 9-11 at the White House reminded me that at the end of your rope and at the end of our nation's rope, there is not nothing. There is Jesus Christ. We sang Amazing Grace. All or some or most of us may know that that incredible hymn was written by one of the greatest, most infamous slavers in the history of the British Empire, John Newton. And John Newton famously said, I am a great sinner, but Jesus is a great savior. Our great savior was present at the White House on 9-11. To Jesus Christ alone be all the glory and amen. God bless you all, and thank you. At this time, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our most honored guests in attendance today at Campus Church. These are the men and women that we refer to as our first responders. They are our hometown heroes that are so often the first on a scene, the first to respond, the first to put their lives in jeopardy, the first to secure a perilous situation, the first to offer life-giving care, the first to offer hope to the injured or abused. They are often those who consistently make bad situations better through their skillful and timely interventions. Whether that be through fighting fires, fighting crime, or attending to the critical care of those in need, we are deeply grateful for your ongoing sacrifices and your service to the Pensacola community, and we are most honored by your presence with us today. If you are one of our first responders or the family member of a first responder, would you at this time, wherever you are, please stand. You may be seated. I know that you all are representative of so many in our Pensacola community for which we are truly grateful. We have placed some things together for you today that we would like to um, just tell you about and, and there are several things on the little gift bag we'll present to you afterwards. I'd like to mention two of the things that will be presented in that bag. First of all, there is a beautiful and a a uh, easy to, to pack copy of the Word of God. It is something upon which our faith is founded. 
It is something that tells the story of the greatest first responder ever to set foot on the face of the earth. So we trust you'll take this with the knowledge that it comes with our very best and our gratefulness for that which you serve. And then there's one other thing that we would like to present, and it is what's referred to commonly as a challenge coin. We had this coin specially minted in honor of you in remembrance of this special day. It'll be presented to you following the service, and each time you see or touch or come across this little coin, please do know that there is a group of people at Campus Church that think the highest of you and your service. We know that you live in a day and you serve in a culture that oftentimes makes your service challenging and difficult to do. But please know, we understand that we are given not only a directive by God, but morality itself tells us to honor the service that you offer on our behalf. We know that you don't carry the sword in vain. We know that you represent the highest form of authority And we're grateful for how you practice it in our own community. So please be reminded when you see that challenge coin that it does come from those who stand deeply grateful for what you offer. We look forward to a time of fellowship with you following the service at a very special meal that has been prepared in your honor. At this time, we're going to continue on with our service and look forward to, in just a few moments, looking in the Word of God at another wonderful first responder. Dr. Zacharias, if you'd come. The Bible says that we're living in perilous times. We're called to stand for Christ, stand for the truth in our day. And that's the call of the church. So let's sing number 661. 661. Let's stand together and sing, O Church, Arise. O Church, Arise. up to you. 
Will you be the one to answer to his call? And will you stand when those around you fall? Will you be the one to take his light into a darkened world? Tell me, will you be the one? Be the one, be the one. Though at times it is hard to know, When the battle lines are drawn, there's a voice that keeps calling out for someone who's not afraid to be a beacon in the night to a world that's lost its way. to his call and will you stand when those around you fall will you be the one will to take his light into a darkened world to a darkened world tell me will you be the one there are still some battles we must fight from day to day Yet the Lord provides the power for us to stand and say, yes, I'll be the one to answer to his call, and I will stand, I'll stand when those I around me fall. I will be the one to take his life into a darkened world. I'll be the one, I'll be the one. If you have a copy of the Word of God, join me today in John chapter 15. John chapter 15. Many in this room would know this, some would not, but I grew up in the home of a first responder. My dad is a retired police sergeant who served over 30 years on the police department in Adrian, Michigan. So there is a lot that I remember about growing up in the home of a first responder. Some of my early, very first memories are my dad in his uniform and I can remember he would be putting it on or taking it off, and that was that, that very thick patent leather belt that would hold his pistol and other equipment that he would carry. And so I can hear my dad put that belt on because it made this specific sound, this little squeak of the leather. He would unroll it and he would put it around his waist. And, and I can remember just as a kid that sense of pride that my dad was heading off to work doing a job that not everyone could or would do, but my dad did. I can remember the very real sense of pride that I had when I would ride with my dad in the police car at the front of a parade, see all of the, you know, my, my schoolmates, my friends on the side, and I would flip the switch and turn on the siren and look at them with a sense of entitlement and maybe put my hand on the shotgun that was right there in the column. I can remember the additional sense of satisfaction as a kid when other kids were saying what their dads did. You know, my dad's an accountant and my dad's a builder and my dad is such and such. And I would say my dad's a cop and my dad can throw your dad in jail, you know. I just. <laughs> loved the sense of, of who it was and what it is that my dad did. I also remember the deep emotion his position brought into our home. 
I remember the profound sadness that came home with my dad after he pulled a child out of the river who had drowned when the ice broke through. I remember the relief that we felt when we learned that he had removed his gun belt and entered into a basement with an armed man and talked him into surrendering his weapon. I remember the pride that we felt when his valor was recognized with formal commendations, one which stated that he, quote, acted beyond normal duty of a police officer when he went into a car that was on fire to help the driver get out without regard for his personal safety. It was noted that if it hadn't been for Redland's efforts, the driver would have died. And I remember the time when another officer on my dad's police force was shot and killed during what would be for most, uh, what would be called a routine traffic stop. There really is no such thing as a routine traffic stop. And at that moment, Bobby Williams in the line of duty laid down his own life. My dad is now 80 years of age, but he is still a cop. When he sleeps, his dreams are filled with times when his body was strong and he's still fighting the bad guys. Not long ago, my parents came upon an accident, and my dad isn't driving anymore, but he got out of the car, went into the middle of the road to, di to direct traffic until the police arrived. I'm not certain that at that stage it is wise for a 79-year-old with Parkinson's to direct traffic, <laughs> but that was my dad's first response. My mom has one of his uniforms saved. Someday he will be buried in his dress blues ever the first responder, ever the cop. These are the kinds of memories that I have, and many of you share the first responder memories that are here today. Of course, today is September 11th. It's a day that we also remember another group of people who laid down their lives. And we should note that of the 2,977 victims killed on 9-11, 415. 415 of them were first responders, those who went to address the terrorist attacks at the World Trade Center. These fallen include firefighters, police officers, emergency medical technicians, and other first responders. These made what we often refer to as the ultimate sacrifice. And today, along with our fellow Americans, we pause to reflect, to honor, and to remember. And with this sobering thought in mind, we look in on another very somber occasion. Jesus and his disciples were in what we refer to as an upper room. And Jesus is preparing those, his followers, those that he had lived with day in and day out for some three and a half years, that exclusive group that we refer to as the disciples, he is preparing them for what is about to take place. Soon, that last supper will come to its conclusion. They will exit the upper room. They will cross the Kidron Valley and enter into Gethsemane. And there, after a time of prayer, a group of soldiers will come and apprehend Jesus, the Christ. Shortly thereafter, will unfold a mock trial, and Jesus, like a lamb to the slaughter, will offer willingly his life on behalf of another. It will be the greatest exchange that has ever been offered. What Jesus is knowingly preparing to do is, I believe, offer the greatest response to the greatest need. We often use superlatives in ways that aren't completely accurate. We talk about the greatest this or the greatest that. But I want you to know I'm not trying to use a superlative in ways that are only fantastic. I truly believe that what Jesus is offering is in fact the greatest response, never a greater, to the greatest need, never a deeper. The Bible says in John chapter 15, beginning in verse number 12, these words, this is my commandment, Jesus speaking, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, 
that a man lay down his life for his friends. As we pause and consider this passage of scripture today, the first thing that stands out to me as I read these words is is as we begin the unavoidable commandment of love. The unavoidable commandment of love. Now, some might ask the question, and it's a legitimate question, can love really be commanded? In other words, can you command someone to love? Because Jesus just said, this is my commandment that ye love one another. How many of you remember a time when you were a kid? Well, let me ask this question first. How many of you grew up with siblings? Clearly, it's not your fault, but they were hard to get along with. Raise your hand. Many of you had siblings just as did I. Okay, it wasn't our fault, but they were difficult to get along with. How many of you ever had... As, as was the case with me, how many of you ever had your mom, after some squabble with your siblings, tell you to tell your, your, your sibling the words, you tell them right now, you go tell him that you love him? How many of you ever had your mom tell you that? And how many of you ever said it with less than sincere emotion? Okay. And here you are standing across from the person that you just wanted to rip their eyes out, and you're supposed to say... I love you, okay? Not the easiest words to offer. So we naturally begin to wonder about this commandment of love. But we would remind ourselves that quite truly love is more of an action than it is a feeling. This is why a first responder is so consistently love on display. Their actions speak for themselves. For example... Love is climbing up the stair tower in the World Trade Center when everyone else is going down. It is love in action. It is love that was commanded and love that is followed. Mike Cahoey is one such firefighter who was climbing up the North Tower when he heard an enormous explosion. It was the South Tower collapsing. He continued to climb until his radio squawked and everyone was ordered to descend and evacuate immediately. Mike was one of those who made it out alive. There's a deep sense of duty when it comes to the actions of a first responder, but a duty to what, we might ask? I believe it is a duty to do what is right. A duty to country, we might ask, a duty to oath. All of these are valid, but they all come from even a higher duty. Ultimately, it is a duty or what we might call a commandment to love one another. That is, I am commanded by my actions to do right by those to whom I have opportunity to do so. All throughout the book of 1 John, we see something repeated over and over again. It's not only or exclusive a a, a truth to 1 John. We see it throughout Scripture, but it's condensed here. 1 John chapter 3, verse 11, for this is the message that ye have heard from the beginning, that ye should love one another. 1 John 3, 23, and this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. 1 John 4, 7, beloved, let us love one another. 1 John 4, 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. This is an unavoidable commandment of love. It, it may be absent of emotion, but our first responders day in and day out, time and time and time again, shift after shift, and oftentimes in settings and situations that are far less than appreciated. They are, in a sense, observing the commandment of love to do right by those with whom they have the opportunity, even the commandment, to do so. It is the unavoidable commandment of love. But as we go a little further in this passage, we see again in John 15, verse number 12, as I have loved you. It's the unparalleled companion of love. There's something now that Jesus says, okay, we have spent these three and a half years together, speaking specifically to his followers, the disciples. They had a companionship. There was something that they had watched unfold time and time again. 
This is not just an empty command from the lips of Jesus. This was the reality of life of the one that they called now their friend. It's as if Jesus is saying to them, let me show you how it's done. He already made this statement to them earlier through an act of unparalleled service. And that is by washing the disciples' feet, the master actually humbling himself in a way culturally that was shocking to the disciples. When Jesus removes his robe, and here the the one most important in their midst girds himself with a towel, and then he humbles himself, and he begins to, as the servant would for the master, he begins to wash the disciples' feet. In John 13, 15, he said, For I have given you an example that ye should do as I have done to you. The the same example that I have have left for you, this is your example. You've seen your companion in a way that is quite frankly unparalleled. Who else does this? Who else does what we so oftentimes see exemplified, fleshed out, right before us time and time again. Well, Jesus, of course, the greatest example, but I'm not so certain that there are not continual examples in those that we call our hometown heroes. I know they're oftentimes misaligned and misrepresented, their motives misconstrued, But I will tell you day in and day out, these are they that among their fellows, their companions, they are providing for us some picture of unparalleled love. They've given us an example. Examples are important and I lived with those in my house growing up. My dad and my mom living out, instilling in us as children, you do this, you don't do this. We, we hear, of course, a lot about firearms today, but I, I grew up understanding the importance of a firearm, how it was to be handled, how it wasn't to be handled. We started out with a BB gun, and my dad would take us and show us how to fire a BB gun, how to load it, how to cock it, where never to point it, how to always know if there was something in its chamber I mean, I I grew up knowing all of these details because my dad said, here's the example. If as a kid, we took the barrel of a BB gun and pointed it in any direction where there was a person, my dad let us know in no uncertain terms that is never how to handle a firearm. And he reinforced that in ways that we would never forget. (laughs) It didn't prevent the curiosity of an early teen. And I'm saying this in a way that is is embarrassing to me. My parents were gone. My brother was upstairs. No one else in the house. And as an early teen, there were things that I knew to do and not to do. And one thing was never to play with my dad's gun. This was back in the 70s, long before people would, would put them in safes and have devices that would actually read your own fingerprint or your hand to be able to remove a device. I knew where my dad kept his little gun that he used as a concealed carry weapon when dad would be off duty. No one was home and I went up and I, and I took that from the place where it was and I removed the clip from the gun because I knew you'd always remove it. And then I also knew that there would never be one necessarily in the chamber, but my dad had always taught me never assume, never assume. I learned all this by example, but didn't always follow it because right now, as an early teen, I have a handgun in my hand in my home. So I removed the clip, and then to make sure that the the chamber was empty, I pointed pointed it at the floor and shot. Much to my surprise, it was not empty. But it was now, okay, it was now. And I fired the gun in our living room on the floor. Now, this was the day of shag carpeting, okay? (laughs) So you could not see what I did. Uh, My brother was upstairs in the shower, and um, he asked later, did you hear something? I didn't hear, no, I didn't hear, (laughs) didn't hear a thing. And, um, And I fired a gun in the home. Obviously, I put the gun away. And, um, and I didn't tell my dad until I was 47, okay? <laughs> Actually, I, 
I was a little younger than that. I was probably in my 30s. And I got a spanking. No, I, I <laughs> didn't get a spanking. Do you know what I did get is I, I got a lifetime reminder of example. I got a lifetime reminder of what to and what not to do. Jesus had followers that had a daily example, although they didn't always follow it. He fleshed out, he lived out in front of them day after day after day, just like I have done to you. You follow my example. It is the unparalleled companion of love. The final thing that I notice in this passage is the undeserved commitment of love. The undeserved commitment of love. In John chapter 15, verse number 13, part of our text today, the Bible says, greater love, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. On September 10th, 2011, American Airlines pilot Steve Scheibner bid for a flight the next day. At the day before a pilot is available to fly, he goes through a series of steps to secure the flight. At three in the afternoon on September 10th, he logged into the pilot's page with American Airlines to see if there were any unassigned flights for the next day. The flight he saw was flight 11 out of Boston, headed to LA. It would depart at 7.45 a.m. and it read available. There was no pilot assigned, so he placed his name in the appropriate place and told his wife that he would be headed to L.A. There is a process that now unfolds. The final confirmation is a phone call when a real person will call the pilot and tell him that trip is confirmed. He already had his computer confirmation, and the final confirmation would come shortly with a phone call. Again, there's a 30-minute window for a phone call to come, which will confirm the flight. That phone call never came. What was taking place was that another pilot, Tom McGinnis, with slightly more seniority, saw that same flight available about 20 minutes after Captain Scheibner had bid the flight. With just minutes of flight availability left, McGinnis called and asked if he could get that flight. He was told that there was a pre-assignment, but if he wanted it, he could get it, but needed to call back within the next 20 minutes to have it assigned. He called back and requested the flight. When he did, they removed the name S. Scheibner and inserted the name T. McGinnis. There was an exchange of names. The next day, McGinnis showed up for work, left on time, flew to about 23,000 feet, and very shortly thereafter, Flight 11 was the first of the hijacked planes to fly into World Trade Center Tower 1. Tom McGinnis died, and Steve Scheibner lived. Steve Scheibner said this, Tom sat in the seat that I was qualified to sit in. And by all rights, that was my seat that day. I should have been in that seat. Not to diminish what Tom McGinnis did, but to magnify what Jesus Christ did. He died in our place. He took the seat that we are qualified to sit in. He died in our place. In Romans chapter 5, beginning in verse 6, the Bible says, For when we were yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commendeth his love toward us in that, or here's how, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Just as Tom and Steve exchanged places, Christ brought about the most marvelous exchange 
that has ever been offered. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 that Christ died for our sins. I believe that Jesus Christ offered the greatest response to the greatest need. Some might say, well, why do I deserve to die? Because the Bible reminds us that the wage, and that is what I have rightly earned, the wage of my sin is death, and death meaning separation, and in this case, separation from God. What I have earned, the seat that I deserve to sit in, is eternal separation from a holy God. When Jesus died as a substitute, not because he earned it, because he lived a sinless, perfect, spotless life. When Jesus died a sinner's death for sinners, just like me, the Bible tells us that he cried out, my God, my God. Interesting, Throughout the course of Jesus' life, he would refer to him as my father, my father. But now on the cross, he cries out, recognizing the position that he is in. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When God is now rent from God. And Jesus, bearing my sin and my shame on my cross, in my place. He paid the debt he did not owe. The songwriter wrote words, and can it be that I should gain an interest in my Savior's blood? Died he for me. It's what Jesus Christ accomplished. It was the greatest response to the greatest need. He certainly is the greatest first responder. He proved he was God by coming victorious out of a borrowed tomb. And now he ever lives, offering the greatest gift ever offered, the gift of God, which is eternal life. I was 17 years old when I accepted that gift, eternal life. It means that once it's offered, it can never end. And I did it through the most simple, childlike means that are possible. I simply recognized who Jesus Christ truly is. He's God who died in my place. And I recognized who I am. I am a sinner, and my sin deserves separation from God. And I realized that God was offering to me the gift of eternal life. Someday I will put off this earthly tabernacle, this tent of clay, so to speak, and, and I will at that moment forever be with the Lord. If there's a person in here today, a person that may be watching, who has never yet responded to the greatest of offerings ever offered to man, may today be your day of salvation. Father, you are always and only good. I know we live in a world that is marked by the reality of evil, but this is not from your hand. You gave mankind the ability to choose, and man chose poorly. And yet, even in our departure from your goodness, you display your goodness in seeking and saving, just as a first responder seeking and saving those that are lost. Father, for any here today who have not yet received your great gift, the gift of God, eternal life, may they come simply and humbly asking you to do for them what they cannot do for themselves. Make them part of your family. Thank you for what you've provided in the person of Jesus Christ. This we pray in the name of the same. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, as this service comes to its conclusion, if you're here today joining us in whatever capacity and you've never yet trusted Jesus Christ, why not today? 
why not simply today, in the quietness of this moment, even right where you're seated, right where you're standing, right where you're watching, why not right now just call out to the one who is offering to you that gift of God, eternal life? Just tell him right now, God, I know I'm a sinner. And I know who Jesus is, my Savior. I know he died not because he deserved it, but because I do. And I accept Jesus Christ, his sacrifice, his gift as my own. Tell him, help me to live for you. Tell him, thank you for saving me. And now, seek to live for him. You know, today, if in the quietness of this moment, you said, Pastor, I, I just prayed that simple little childlike prayer. And I do believe that God does what he says he'll do. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Are there ever any greater words? Whoever, that's me and you. I'm here to, to tell you today with the utmost confidence, if today you called on Jesus Christ to save you, he keeps his word, he did what he promised he would do. By his grace, may you live for him. In a few moments, this service will dismiss. There are men that will be standing down here if today you'd say, Pastor, I'd like to learn more about what it means to be saved, then let me encourage you, following this service today, come shake their hand and say, hey, can you tell me more about what was presented today regarding Jesus Christ? Thank you again, Father, for such a, an extension of amazing grace that reaches poor sinners just like us. Thank you again for our greatest responder. And Lord, thank you for those who've joined us today in this place, our first responders. Lord, may you dismiss us today in, in these closing moments with the reality of your blessing upon us. And this we pray in Jesus' name, amen. In just a moment, Dr. Zacharias is going to come. We're going to sing again one of those choruses from Amazing Grace. Julie and I are going to be out in the main lobby. If you're a guest here today, we'd certainly be honored to just put our hand in yours and tell you thank you for joining us. And then if you're one of our first responders today and their families, we have prepared a very special luncheon for you. And we trust that you'll join us. It is going to be right outside the north area. So if you go across, head to the north, up towards main campus, it's in the McKenzie building, in the great hall of the McKenzie building. And um, we have some special things prepared for you. We'd like to present your gift to you over there. But if for some reason you can't stay for that luncheon, then your gifts will be at the main lobby um, welcome center. And we do hope that each of you will stop and receive one of those gifts. Dr. Zacharias, if you would come and um, close us in a song. What a great service. Let's stand together and sing Amazing Grace one more time. Lift up your voice. Amen. Have a good afternoon.